Martha Moxley was discovered on her lawn in 1975, with a golf club protruding from her neck. The main suspects were two Kennedy nephews, but there is still a lot of controversy around whether or not they are guilty. One of the most intriguing crimes in recent American history has been the murder of 15-year-old Martha Moxley, partly because it took 27 years to find a guilty party. But because the convicted man was Michael Skakel, a member of America's royal family, the Kennedys, it has also earned a terrible place in the country's criminal history. Moxley mentioned her neighbor Skakel, who was 15. In her diary entry from 1975, noting that she needed to stop going over there. Months after writing this, she was discovered dead in her backyard. She was stabbed and beaten to death with a golf club. Skagel was ultimately sentenced to 11 years in prison for the crime before being freed in 2013 after his conviction was reversed. But the extent of his guilt is still a matter of debate. Indeed, many people think that justice has yet to be served. Let us start at the very beginning to comprehend this perplexing scenario. On August the 30th, 1960, Martha Elizabeth Moxley was born. In addition to her parents and older brother John, she grew up in Piedmont, California. The Moxley family moved to Bellhaven, a wealthy area of Greenwich, Connecticut, in 1974. Moxley's mother, Dorothy, observed, It was one of these neighborhoods. The kids could just go meet people. Very safe. She was named Best Personality in Middle School and gained friends quickly. Moxley, a basketball player and a straight-A student, appeared to have it all. Up until Halloween, 1975 that is. Michael and Thomas Skagel are the nephews of Ethel Skagel and her husband, Robert F. Kennedy, the brother of President John F. Kennedy. Rushton and Ann Skagel, Ethel Skagel's brother, had seven children together. Among them are Thomas and Michael Skagel who knew Moxley and were respectively 17 and 15 years old when she was killed in 1975. The Skagels were not a happy family. In later works, Michael Skagel mentioned chronic illness, alcoholism, and a repressive Catholic moral and a repressed sensual outlook as the main reasons for the problems in the home. In 1973, Rushton Skakel's drinking got worse, and Skakel passed away from brain cancer, and he frequently left his children alone at home with little to no supervision and unrestricted funds. Michael Skakel claimed that his mother's passing caused an even more intense level of chaos to rule our household. The Moxleys lived approximately 150 yards away, and the Skakels, who lacked parental supervision, had a regular stream of youngsters coming and going. The teenage girl had conflicting emotions over the advances she had started to get from Tom Skakel, as stated in Martha Moxley's diary, which she frequently referred to. She wrote on September the 12th, 1975, Dear Diary, me, Jackie, Michael, Tom, Hope, Maureen, and Andra went driving in Tom's car. I was practically sitting on Tom's lap because I was only steering. He kept putting his hand on my knee. Then I was driving again and Tom put his arm around me. He kept doing stuff like that. In her diary, Moxley also voiced her annoyance with Michael Skakel. On September the 19th, 1975, she noted the following. 
Michael was so totally out of it that he was being a real asshole in his actions and words. He kept telling me that I was leading Tom on when I didn't like him except as a friend. I said, well, how about you and Jackie? You keep telling me that you don't like her and you're all over her. He doesn't understand that he can be nice to her without hanging all over her. In Michael Skakel's trial, the prosecution would subsequently refer to these entries. Teenagers in Greenwich called the night before Halloween Mischief Night when they would walk the streets pulling practical jokes. The night usually ended with a lawn covered in tissue paper, but nothing more serious. In 1975, however, Mischief Night brought about a change. That evening, Moxley went out with her companions. Her mother phoned her pals when she was not home by four in the morning. When her daughter still was not back the following morning, Dorothy Moxley called various people. Moxley's other friend informed Dorothy that she had last seen the adolescent the previous evening with Tom Skagel. That day, Michael Skakel answered the door when Dorothy knocked and told her he had not seen her daughter. Sheila, a close friend of Martha Moxley, made a horrifying discovery shortly after midday. The missing teen was found face down at the edge of the Moxley property beneath a huge pine tree. Despite having blood on her clothes and her jeans and garments pulled down to her ankles, no signs of an assault were ever discovered. A six-iron golf club that had been used to repeatedly hit Moxley was lying next to the adolescent. The club split into three pieces because of the force of the hit. One of the broken pieces of the club had also been used to stab Moxley in the neck. Investigators quickly found that a Tony Pena club that resembled the one at Moxley's murder scene in the Skagel residence was missing, and Skagel's name was etched on the handle of the broken club found in the Skagel residence. Naturally, since Tom Skakel was the last person to have seen Moxley alive, detectives concentrated their inquiry on him. When questioned, Tom Skakel admitted to police that Moxley was last seen outside his home around 9.30 p.m. He said farewell to her and went inside, where he and the family's new live-in tutor, Kenneth Littleton, watched the French Connection. After that, he entered his room and began in writing a paper for school about Abraham Lincoln. However, his instructors denied ever giving him this homework. Finally, a lie detector test was administered to Tom Moxley, which he passed. He was never indicted for anything. In the autumn of 1976, there was also an inquiry into Kenneth Littleton. According to reports, Littleton was unaware of who Martha Moxley was. He spent his first night at the Skakel house the night she was slain. Littleton was never charged in the case, despite failing three lie detector tests. Detectives thought Moxley had been struck from behind around 10 o'clock. When asked about his travels that evening, Michael Skakel said to detectives that he had driven to his cousin's house around 9.15 p.m. and then returned home around 11 p.m. The case then went unsolved for almost 20 years. In 1991, the investigation into the murder of Martha Moxley was reopened after it was suggested that William Smith Kennedy, another member of the Kennedy family, might have been involved. Even if the rumor was untrue, the case was once more in the news. This time, Michael Skakel was made a suspect. Rushton Skagel sparked this investigation by hiring a private eye to clear his family name 
He secretly hoped that material would surface that would implicate other individuals, particularly former suspect Kenneth Littleton. His strategy, however, was a total failure. The two private investigators hired were Willis Billy Krebs, a former lieutenant in the NYPD, and former FBI agent Jim Murphy. When Tom and Michael Skakel were questioned by the two men about their activities on the night of Moxley's killing, it was found that both boys had lied to the police. Tom Skakel admitted that the time he last saw Martha outside his house was closer to 10 p.m. than 9.30 p.m. Before going back inside, Tom had a romantic encounter with Martha outside his home. Krebs adds that when Skagel confessed this, he began to cry, but his attorney stopped him before he could continue. When Michael Skagel returned home from his cousin's house at about 11 p.m., he told the investigator that he had not gone to bed. In reality, he pleasured himself outside Martha Moxley's bedroom window after climbing a tree. Dominic Dunn, a writer and journalist, obtained the findings of the investigator and gave it to the state inspector Frank Gar, a former detective on the case. He had always had his doubts about Michael Skakel, but they were dispelled. His theory would gain momentum as a result of this report. A one-man grand jury and an investigator were tasked with reviewing the Martha Moxley case in 1998. Judge George N. Thiem decided that there was enough proof to accuse Michael Skagel of killing her after reviewing the evidence. Skagel's former classmate who attended a land school, a specialized institution for problematic children, stated that Skagel even confessed to them while they were there. Gregory Coleman, a former classmate, stated during his testimony during the pretrial hearing in June of 2000 that Skagel had informed him, I am going to get away with murder. I am a Kennedy. He had made a comment that he was trying to make advances toward this girl and that this girl was not complying with those advances. So he drove her skull in, Coleman continued. Coleman passed away from a heroin overdose in August of 2001. Therefore, he was unable to testify in Skagel's 2002 murder case. Skagel recorded audio for his memoir, Dead Man Talk. A Kennedy Cousin Comes Clean. In 1997, with the help of Richard Hoffman, his ghostwriter. During the trial, one recording was especially incriminating. Skagel claimed that on the evening of Moxley's murder, he had consumed alcohol, smoked marijuana, and was aroused. Skagel froze when Dorothy Moxley knocked on his home that morning. On the tape, he stated, I was still high from the previous night, a little drunk. He claimed to have wondered, did they see me last night? Skagel claimed he was concerned the Moxleys had caught him pleasuring him himself in their tree, but the prosecution countered that Skagel was terrified about being seen hitting Moxley with a golf club. Skagel's defense countered that there was no physical evidence to support his conviction and that he had an alibi for the period surrounding Moxley's murder. However, the prosecution portrayed a picture of a jealous teenager who was angry when his sweetheart rejected him. Yeah. He was high on drugs and alcohol and who had access to the murder weapon. The jury returned with a guilty verdict on June 7, 2002. Skagel received a 20-year-to-life prison term. Skagel's attorneys and friends campaigned to get his conviction overturned while he was incarcerated. There were four appeals submitted, but they were all rejected. Skagel was granted a new trial on October the 23rd, 2013, because Mickey Sherman, his defense counsel, gave him constitutionally deficient representation. 
Skagel was thus free on a $1.2 million bail on November the 21st, 2013. Skagel's conviction was overturned in December of 2016 after prosecutors waged a tenacious battle to have it overturned. The Connecticut Supreme Court decided on a 4-3 to three vote that Skagel's representation was valid. But that was not the end of the matter. With yet another 4-3 to three decision in May of 2018, the court overturned its previous decision and found that Skagel's attorney, Mickey Sherman, had neglected to provide evidence of Michael's alibi at the initial trial. On October 31, 2020, the chief state's attorney decided not to pursue further legal action against Skagel. Michael Skagel has now filed a lawsuit against the municipality of Greenwich and a detective who obtained the tapes in 1999 to recoup the set of audio tapes that were used in the trial that were resulted in his conviction for the killing of Martha Moxley in Greenwich in 1975. The case was filed in April of 2023. John David Moxley, Martha's father, passed away in 1988, never seeing justice for his daughter. John Moxley, Martha Moxley's brother, and their mother still think Skagel is guilty. Particularly, Dorothy Moxley is sure that Skagel's wealth and influential connections are the cause of his current freedom. The state of Connecticut had a very, very, very good case, and we absolutely know who killed Martha, she asserted. If Michael Skagel came from a poor family, this would have been over. But because he comes from a family of means, they've stretched this out all these years, she said. Skagel's cousin, Robert F. Kennedy Jr., who authored the book, Framed, why Michael Skagel spent over a decade in prison for a murder he didn't commit in 2016 is one of many who thinks Skagel is innocent. As usual, my thoughts are with the family. Dorothy has done nothing for years but fight for justice for Martha. She stated she believes the death of Martha killed her father. He could never get over the loss of his little girl. What would Martha have been? What would her children have been? We would have had grandchildren by now. On a dreadful Halloween night in 1974, everything was extinguished. I am very interested in hearing your thoughts. What do you think happened to Martha? If you would like to see more Halloween content, please click my playlist below. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you on the next one.